Uh, speakers are here and our very esteemed, esteemed, respected expert panel are here. Um, I very warmly invite our judges. First of all, I very warmly invite our chairman, Dr. Virendra Agarwal. I don't know why he's sitting there. We, we seat some for you. We get up. And uh, we all, a special uh, welcome to Dr. Arun Chetrapal, Dr. Anil Radhakrishnan, who finally was bulldozed to sit here. And then we go on to a very special uh, thanks to Dr. Uh, Dr. Santosh Bide. Dr. Sunita Dubey has not come. Uh, Dr. Swapna Nair, Dr. Matthew Kurian, Dr. Nanda Kishore, Dr. Gopal Raju, Dr. Na Vishnu Nadela, yeah, <laughs> Dr. Jignesh, you just came. Yeah, I didn't yeah, see yeah. you. were in my blind spot. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. And Dr. Yeah. Rajiv Sukumaran. Yeah. Others have not come. No, Dr. Dr. Bhavikar. Bhavikar, Dr. Bhavikar is... Chashma Balna. Bhavikar, you are in this session, in the final one. In this one. Okay, you are very important. We will start with the session. We start with our first speaker, Dr. John Davis. Dr. John Davis is all over ARC and the, uh, he is going to be, the discussant is going to be Dr. Santosh Bide and Dr. Rajiv Sukumaran, both of you. Dr. Santosh and Dr. Rajiv Sukumaran, both of you are going to be discussant. Okay. The next, uh, you will call. And the discussant, you know. May I start, ma'am? Yes, yes. So my uh, video is on practicing surgeries at home, kitchen ophthalmic surgeon. So this is uh, about how during the, uh, when you are stuck at home without access to a wet lab, you can still practice surgeries. This was because of the COVID pandemic and lockdown that this happened. So I'll just uh, play from here.
If available, loading of foldable inodes can be practiced. Along with the proper injection of the iodes. Other than cataract, trabeculectomy flap can also be practiced on the oil lane. John, that was, as usual, an excellent presentation. The value of this uh, presentation is that it does not involve, involve any costly equipment. Yes, Everything sir. is available at home and you have done, you have proven that even the people, people in the learning stage also can practice all this at home. Congratulations. Very good. Thank you, sir. Yeah, as always, out of the box thinking by you. I have observed you in last uh, AIOC also. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, well done, actually. Very good. Thank you, Keep it up. Should we go on to our... Uh, Can I ask him some questions? Yes. Uh, regarding the texture and all that, the way you said the keratome entry and all, is it the same feel that you have it otherwise or it is quite different? The because texture if you're is learning it, not the same. Sir. Yeah. So but that is only, I think, a short shortcoming out of it. But otherwise, it's a fantastic but idea the way we go yes, about sir. it. I would like to add that if you have access to eyeballs, yeah. that would be better. So if you have human eyeballs, best. If you have, uh, say, pig eyeballs or goat eyeballs, that will be good. But you cannot do all this while you are at home. Because at home, getting an eyeball and practicing surgery is frowned upon. So if you are at home, st stuck in the kitchen, you don't have access to wet lab, Anybody can do this. You don't Tact have to gross out. Feel is as, not there. as a starting point, it is very good because once at least you get a feel of how to hold it and all. Yes, of course, definitely later on. This is the first step, but a very fantastic thank you, idea. Thank you, thank you, thank yes. you. We have to go on to yeah. the next. Yeah. I think we'll have only one person discussing. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Uh, from kitchen, we move on to uh, the next speaker, who is uh, Dr. Vikas Virwal, who is speaking to us on DASP delineation technique with Novel release sign for correct plane identification in smile surgery. Good afternoon, Dr. everyone. Dr. Is, uh, is the discussion. Dr. Sobna Nair, the famed uh, refractive surgeon in uh, Kerala, is the discussion. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be here to present a new technique that will make smile surgery a piece of cake for even novice surgeons. So as we all know, uh, smile surgery uh, has marked the paradigm shift significantly from flap-based LASIK procedures to flapless surgery. But it comes with its steep learning curve and challenging uh, complications, especially for novice surgeons. Most often, the complication that occurs is lenticule misdissection that results in nightmares for the surgeon and poor outcomes for the patient. So uh, in a conventional smile surgery, you have two areas of delineation that are done, one on the right side and one on the left side. The two areas are one for the anterior plane and one for the posterior plane. But with this technique, uh, there is significant risk of having initial unintended posterior plane delineation resulting in cap lenticular addition. So to overcome this, we present the double anterior single posterior delineation technique with a novel release sign that which we have described. In this technique, we suggest you have two areas of anterior plane delineation on right and left sides with a central area of posterior plane delineation. We recommend differential entry maneuvers for anterior and posterior plane delineations. For the anterior plane marked by the red arrows, you see the instrument entering between the cap edge and the lenticule edge, which we can see here in the video. And then the dissector is curved inwards towards the anterior plane. Now, as the anterior plane of the lenticule is in continuation with the undersurface of the cap, with this maneuver, you are highly unlikely to enter into the 
posterior plane. So on both these sides, with using the same maneuver, you do anterior plane delineation, leaving the central area. Now you do the posterior plane delineation centrally, and here the entry is straight in with slight posterior pressure on the cornea. So this makes sure you enter into the posterior plane. And when you are doing posterior plane delineation, you see resistance on both the edges, which has been described as stop sign previously, but we call it the double stop sign because you have a double stop on both the edges. This gives you reconfirmation that both the initial delineations were in the anterior plane. And now after you have noticed the double stop sign, you can start with the anterior plane dissection from one of the sides. Now when you do the anterior plane dissection from one of the sides, as we will see in the video ahead, that you move the, take the long dissector from one of the areas where you have delineated the anterior plane and as you move across and cross over to the other anterior delineated area, there is a sudden release of resistance because that area has already been delineated. This you can see here again that as you move across towards the other area of anterior delineation, there will be a sudden release of resistance and you can see that coming here, here. So you can clearly see that they, this gives you another confirmation that there is your initial delineations were in the anterior plane only. And when you do the posterior dissection, you don't see any release sign because there, there was only a single area of posterior delineation that had happened. Now following your dissections have been completed and you have confirmed they were correct, the rest of the surgery is proceeded in the normal fashion. Now uh, we performed this surgery as an OI surgeon with less than 5 cases of experience and did not have any lenticular misdissection in 60 cases. And the advantages of our technique is that it's very simple, easy to adapt and is very repeatable. Can it be equally safe in even low myopia patients? and also gives an opportunity to rescue because you have two areas, at least one is likely to be correct for anterior plane delineation. But the biggest advantage is for the surgeon is the multiple checkpoints that it provides. The first checkpoint being the differential entry maneuver for anterior and posterior plane dissections. The second checkpoint being the double stop sign and the third checkpoint being the release sign. So you have three checkpoints that assures you. So to conclude with our technique of DASP delineation, both the surgeon and the patient are going to walk out with a big smile on their faces after every smile surgery. Thank you. Nice. Very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, that, that was a very comprehensive presentation. Uh, so did you uh, uh, compare it with, uh, you know, uh, the first uh, 60 eyes of an, uh, um, that a novice surgeon has done uh, uh, normally with uh, compared to what uh, you have advised? No, because... Uh, mm -hmm. As these all 60 eyes, I'm talking about me as an OI surgeon mm -hmm. with, I, when I had less than five cases of experience. Uh, firstly, it would be, uh, you know, uh, prop, not a proper comparison because if there are two different surgeons for the two different no, types sure. of surgeries, okay. then you might not get the same results. And uh, yes, one of my colleagues who was starting with me did have at least two or three cases of lenticular misdissection where the senior had to take over because the posterior plane was... In, in the first five cases you did, did you find it harder than when you started doing this? I found it this? harder and I was always uncertain because the signs which have been described previously, they're not easy to identify. The meniscus sign and the other signs that have been described are not easy to identify. So I found it difficult and I was always uncertain and looking over to my optometrist who was more experienced that am I in the correct plane, am I in the correct plane. So once I started doing this, I was very certain uh, that I am doing the dissection in the correct planes only. So you had no problems by cutting through the, uh, you know, in low myopia cases through the lens. Not at all, not at all, because there were two areas, so you were very certain that uh, you are doing it correctly. Thank you. Thank you. The next presenter is Dr. Rudhya Mogan and she'll be talking on slow, slow swill phaco. And Good the discussion will be Dr. Virendra Agarwal. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll be presenting my video. Slow swirl phaco. Slow swirl phaco is a novel surgical technique for soft posterior polar cataracts. This technique does not require hydro procedure or rotation of nucleus. There is no sculpting, cracking, or chopping of nucleus. Machine parameters are kept low. Following capsular rexes, the phaco probe is inserted and moved in a swirling fashion. The movement is from center to periphery 
and also from superficial to deeper layers. The aim of the swelling movement is to remove the central chunk of cataract. So a large crater is created with exposure of the underlying polar opacity. Some amount of spontaneous hydro from the irrigation sleeves help in removing the cataract in layers. The epinuclear layers opposite to the incision can be aspirated then with the FACO probe in low parameter settings. The subincisional layers are also shaved off by swirling motion of the FACO probe. Once the slow swirl is complete, what is left behind is the central polar opacity and the sub-incisional thin epinuclear plate. Visco is then injected and the FACO probe is withdrawn. Now controlled visco dissection is then performed in multiple quarters in order to loosen up the sub-incisional epinuclear sheet. This can be then removed easily using the coaxial probe. The polar opacity is removed last. Not all cases of slow swirl technique requires visco dissection, as in this case. Here, slow swirl technique is performed. What is left behind is the central polar opacity and the sub incisional epinuclear sheet. Instead of performing visco dissection, here a blunt tipped spatula is inserted from the side port and it is moved in a swiping fashion in order to loosen up the sub incisional epinuclear sheet. It is then aspirated easily. In cases of slow swirl FACO where there was a posterior polar plaque, posterior capsular vexus was performed. This was a young patient who had a dense posterior polar plaque and pre-existing dot-like anterior vitreous opacities. He underwent a slow swirl technique and he had no breach in the posterior capsule adjugent. Endocrine employed in 20 patients with soft posterior polar cataracts and none of the patients had any hydrogenic complications. The advantages of this technique are that it avoids hydro procedures which could predispose to posterior capsular rent. Visco dissection is avoided or minimal. It avoids fluctuations in the anterior chamber and the polar opacity is removed last. Hence, it's a safe technique. Thank you. Thank you. I must appreciate the effort you have done. But uh, what was the size of Rexis? So five millimeter excess. Uh, just because I think to the remove more of the material, you'll require to have bigger excess, which we usually prefer not to be big in posterior polar cataracts. Yes, because sometimes if it is required, if we can use, use yeah it, optic sir. capture something. So we the, could do a oval excess also, sir. So it will be a little easier to do epinuclear removal. I think. Yeah. So the one thing that modification may be required. The another thing using this technique in very soft sometime will cause that the whole of the lens material yes, sir, yes, will expose the posterior capsule. Yes, so I think doing mild hydro delineation will be more useful than this. Yes, that is another thing. And the third thing is that you are using a tip which is almost 30 degree kind of thing. Yes, so you can use a 0 degree or 15 degree tip that will be better for these kind of short swill movement. Okay, and preferably it should be done through 1.8 millimeter FACO kind of tip so you have easy maneuverability rather than a normal 2.2 or 2.8 FACO. Okay. So these are my suggestions, but otherwise it's a good approach. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now call the next speaker. Yeah, now I call upon uh, Dr. Apurva for her presentation on uh, innovative bladeless sterigem surgery, a non-traumatic approach. The discussions would be Dr. Nanda Kishore and Dr. Arun Shetrapal. You can't sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
party there. Can I start? Yes, yes. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Apurva, and today I'll be talking upon uh, uh, bladeless innovative terigem surgeries, a non-traumatic approach. As we all know, that terigem is a progressive, non-inflammatory, and uh, wing-shaped degeneration of the conjunctiva over the cornea. Because it is an agricultural country in India, UV rays have raised the risk of terigem uh, to a higher level. And uh, but terigem excision surgery can be performed by any ophthalmologist, may it be a retina surgeon, a glaucoma surgeon cornea surgeon or a cataract surgeon. So uh, the need to know about the terigem excision surgery is very important for all the surgeons. The terigem excision techniques is, uh, available are Bayes-Lara technique, amniotic membrane grafting, CAG with sutures and CAG with fibrin glue. But for terigem head removal, we mostly use blades that is beaver knife, 26 gauge needles, scalpel blade, diamond knife and crescent blade. If you are a senior surgeon, then you will know how to get the correct plane of dissection and how to dissect the tissue from the corneal tissue. But if for the novice surgeon, it may lead to complications like reduced wetting, retained tissue, injury to the Bowman's membrane, irregular plane of dissection or poor cosmesis. To avoid these complications is new surgeons which are learning terigem surgery. We have come up with the two innovative uh, atraumatic techniques that is the terry snip and terry peel. Terry snip, a suture based terigem removal. Step so, one, a superficial epithelial incision is made with a 26 gauge needle parallel to the head of the terigium. Step two, a small neck is made in the lateral borders of the neck of the terigium. Step three, a cyclodialysis spatula is passed beneath the pterygeal tissue from one end of the neck to the other to create a clear dissection plane. Step four, a 4 silk suture is now passed in the same dissected plane. Step five, a tight hold of the suture ends is obtained by using a clamp and tying forceps. Step six, a slight countertraction is applied toward the base of the pterygium with the spatula that's held in position under the neck tissue by assisting staff. Step seven, swiping movements are then made along the dissection plane toward the apex of the pterygium. This action will remove the entire pterygial head with no residual tissues underneath. So the disadvantages of this technique are two people are required for the counter-traction and the abnormal plane of dissection can lead to retained tissue post-surgery. Bladeless technique In the is second technique. a peel-off technique for pterygium head removal. Step 1. A superficial epithelial incision is made with a 26-gauge needle parallel to the head of the pterygium. Step 2. Identical to a conventional pterygial head removal, the neck of the pterygium is cut with scissors at the limbal border. Step 3. A good grip of the complete pterygial head is obtained with a clamp. This clamp helps to achieve hemostasis in the bleeding pterygeal tissue and also aids in easy removal. Step four, the clamp is then used to peel off the pterygeal head in a centripetal pattern so that the entire head is removed in two or three movements. The residual tissue after this technique is so minimal that it completely alleviates usage of the blade and a simple polish of the burr is adequate. So the disadvantages of this technique are customized instrument for grasping is not available and lack of counter traction can lead to globe traction and harder grades of terigem are difficult to manage. These are our two simple and effective techniques for a bladeless terigium incision that anyone can easily adopt. Yeah, I noticed that uh, you still used a blade in the Sorry. second procedure. Yes, sir. And then instead of a blade, you used a 26 gauge needle. What's the specific advantage? I mean, it's some form of cutting, whether you use a blade or a needle. Uh, does sir, it? Uh, does the needle help you in any particular way to uh, control your depth of uh, cutting? Sir, or it's the same with the blade? Sir, in needle, we are only uh, doing an incision over the superficial epithelium. We are not going any deeper. So just for the plane, uh, so that it doesn't go any further, that we are removing the tissue. We are just cutting it to give a border of the cut to come out. We are not going to uh, 
cause the uh, we are not uh, trying to dissect the plane with the needle sir the plane yeah. we are trying to get from the base of the pterygium so that we can extend that same plane because uh, new surgeons we are finding it difficult uh, to find the plane they keep on scratching with the blade and then it leads to multiple planes and uh, retained tissue is left at the end of the surgery even in the peel technique i noticed that there was some residual tissue left uh, yes sir little so, bit uh, if even if little bit residual tissue is there so it can be loosened and uh, it can be washed off with the little minimal bird usage sir excellent technique uh, the idea i think be, uh, uh, behind giving a cut is that uh, you don't peel more of an epithelium yes. so epithelium peeling is limited to that area excellent uh, idea uh, i think this technique will work with the uh, atrophic pterygiums and will not work in the young people who have very strong adhesions i'm slightly skeptical whether this will work in uh, yes, young uh, so uh, mostly it is for the getting the correct plane of dissection and then uh, uh, it is not for uh, the severe grades of pterygium mostly mm. for mild to moderate grades of pterygium uh, yeah, which is and maybe atrophic pterygium in the older yes. people it will work fantastically well i'm yes. sure thank you very thank much you. thank you thank you yeah next we have uh, dr nadella vishnu vardhan uh, who is speaking on fiber or plaque no 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 he is the not he is the discussant okay okay sorry sorry, sorry. No, yeah sorry, yeah sorry sorry sorry, 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 sorry. Huh. yeah dr okay. ravi kulkarni and the discussant is uh, dr nadella vishnu vardhan and dr chandrashekar vardhan thank you good afternoon everybody is playing sound dr chandrashekar sir sound volume volume time reset the time volume is not there the audio should be connected exactly does that ah. one after aspiration but complete it safe removal of the last bit of fibers from the capsule bag is very crucial in every case to achieve a clean bag here is a technique which exactly does that after aspiration of the nucleus a jet of bss is injected from the main tunnel hitting the posterior capsule tangentially loosening the fiber or plaque from the posterior capsule 24 gauge catheter mounted on a two inch sleeve the piston is taken out now only outer jacket is available and 24 gauge catheter is ready to take out every bit of fiber plaque from the pc ac ventilator is on and bottle is at around 100 cm height 24 gauge catheter is taken nearer the raised edge of the fiber or plaque The BS is rushing into the syringe through this 24 gauge catheter passively will take away all the fibers safely without damaging the posterior capsule. Let us see another case. A jet of BS is is hit gently tangentially to the posterior capsule to loosen the cortical fibers. 24 gauge catheter mounted on a 2 ml syringe without piston the globe is stabilized with one hand the 24 gauge catheter is taken nearer the raised edge of the fibers bss flowing into the catheter will take away on the fibers safely at times you can see here posterior capsule comes out to the port but hardly gets damaged Hands are changed. Fiber cleaning is done from the opposite side. One should have lot of patience so that the fiber removal is done safely and completely. The trick here is opening of these cannulas is at the tip. Area available is more compared to the ports of a bimanual where the opening is at the top. This is another case. The jet of BSS will loosen the PC plug. 
the eye is stabilized with one hand. The 24 gauge cannula mounted on a cleavable syringe without piston is taken nearer the raised edge of the block. The BSS gushing into the syringe through this cannula will take away all the fibers safely and completely. There is no active aspiration here. The BSS flows passively, taking away all the fibers. To conclude, this is an innovative technique where these tiny instruments are used to help out remove complete removal of the last bit of fiber or cortex, which is very safe and highly reproducible. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, nicely done. Yeah, it's a nice presentation. Uh, what is the advantage over uh, CAPAC technique? What, sir? What is the advantage of this procedure over the CAPAC procedure? CAPAC, CAPAC can you can control. do, but you'll be aspirating actively. At times, the PC may come. If it is very much adherent to the PC, it may come. Here, I have done in many cases, uh, none of the time it has, uh, I have damaged the PC. I found it very safe and very easy, very simple. You can control all parameters in CAPAC also. But of course, it's a definitely a new approach, innovative method. And the uh, port is at the tip. The area available is more. All of the things, you can peel it up. That's good. Thank good you. Time. Yeah, excellent. Uh, only two questions. Uh, did you have to hydrate the side ports so that the entire flow is directed towards the your syringe? No need, sir. The opening is very small, 24, 23 cannula only can go, snugly fits in. No yeah, leak. but uh, suppose there is a leak from the side port, it will decrease the efficiency of your system. No, 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 because AC maintainer maintains it all throughout with the same pressure. When it is more, when the Washes. fluid is coming more, AC maintainer will, uh, flow will be more. And did you try to adjust bottle height to change the, you know, the flow? Sometimes, the, uh, you know, decreasing the water oil may make it more gentle. No decreasing, sir. It should be above 100 only. If you have done already 3-4 cases, the liquid is less, BSS is less, I may increase it to 110, something like that. Suppose the patient has advanced glaucoma or very advanced diabetic retinopathy, we are bothered about the intraocular pressure. Yes, of course, it affects, but hardly it takes uh, uh, 15 to 20 seconds. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, madam. Thank you, doctor. You can collect your certificate. The next presenter is Dr. Dr. Ashish. He'll be presenting on a hybrid 26 gauge needle drainage technique in sterile buckling. And the discussion will be Dr. C. V. Gopal Raju, sir. Okay, good afternoon to all. So I'll be talking about hybrid 26 gauge needle drainage technique in scleral buckling, a mini scleral cut down. So uh, there are various techniques to, uh, to drain the fluid from, uh, drain sub subretinal fluid in cases of scleral buckling. And the initial technique was described by Shippens, which was actually a two-step scleral cut down, where he used a scleral blade and then diathermizing the choroid and then using a needle to drain the fluid. Because of the large sclerotomy, there is a risk of retinal and vitreous incarceration, bleeding from the choroid and sudden hypotomy. To counter this, there are various other needle drainage techniques which have been described like needle drainage technique, modified needle drainage technique, and a guarded needle drainage technique. Now, the technique described by Charles et al., it involves the use of indirect ophthalmoscopy and a use of a 25G needle, which passes obliquely through the sclera into the subretinal space. The problem is that it is a steep learning curve, and also oblique passes through the choroid increases the chances of choroidal hemorrhage. Contrary to this, the technique described by Azad et al. uses a 26 gauge needle without a plunger, does not require an indirect ophthalmoscope, and it causes, uh, and we have to go perpendicular into the subretinal space. But the problem which I felt while I was in my residency doing this modified needle drainage technique was that as soon as the needle enters into the subretinal space and crosses the sclera as well as the choroid, there is a sudden loss of resistance. And as a result, the needle just gives away and there's a high chance that the needle might go and hit the retinal surface, especially in cases of shallow retinal detachments. So there's a jerk which is felt as soon as the needle PSC is the choroid as well as the sclera. So basically to avoid this jerk, we have described a technique where we perform a mini sclera cut down using a 26 gauge needle. And we have called it as a hybrid needle drainage technique, which is a hybrid of a scleral cut down technique and a modified needle drainage technique. So in this technique, basically uh, what we do is we create a mini scleral cut down using 
the tip of a 26 gauge needle. So here, this is done by doing linear movements and scraping off the scleral surface. And this is done till the choroid starts to appear. So it is at this point that very gently you poke inside the subretinal space using the tip of the needle. And it leads to a passive aggression of fluid. Following this, a cotton bud applicator is used to basically drain out the rest of the fluid. So we've already published this technique as a pilot study in, uh, international, uh, in Indian Journal of Ophthalmology and it was a retrospective study where we evaluated the efficacy and safety of hybrid 26 gauge needle drainage technique in scleral buckling. Uh, Intraoperative surgical details and postoperative details were noted down. And the adequacy of drainage was assessed by indirect ophthalmoscopy. And it was graded from grade one to grade four where grade one was defined as a complete drainage of subretinal fluid, whereas grade four was defined as dry type. So a total of 10 patients were done and a complete drainage of SRF was achieved in five patients and a par partial but adequate drainage was achieved in rest of the five patients. In none of the patients, inadequate or dry trap was encountered. No intraoperative complications were encountered. And in most of the cases, we were able to drain within by two, in a single attempt. Only in two cases, two attempts were required. The retina was attached in eight out of 10 eyes at one week and one month of follow-up. So till date, we performed roughly around 70 to 80 cases uh, with a similar technique. And what we have found is that it has various advantages, like it is more controlled, and this can even be performed in cases of shallow retinal detachments. As the point of entry through the choroid is so small, diathermy of the choroid before entering into the subretinal space is not required. This small opening in the choroid also avoids the risk of vitreous or retinal incarceration. And as the needle is entering into the uh, subretinal space in a perpendicular fashion, so the chances of choroidal hemorrhage or subretinal hemorrhage are drastically reduced. Thank you. Yeah, that was a good uh, innovation, but uh, only you have using the needle instead of the blade of the earlier technique, and then the the size also it is less when compared with the. That yes, is sir, a, the problem with needle technique is, sir, it gives a sudden jerk most of the times. So it is always better to scrape off the scleral surface first. It will reduce the resistance, and then one can easily poke in. But earlier we were using the blade. And then cauterizing. Yes, so sir. this is only you're avoiding cautery and then the opening also is less. These are the two improvements. Yes. Uh, but with the, so, uh, with the blade, there's no, uh, we're not able to actually scrape off the scleral surface. We can actually make a cut in the sclera. In this, even if it, does, it is a thin sclera like high myopics, you can actually control how much amount of sclera you want to scrape off. And then as soon as the choroid is visible, you just gently poke inside. Okay, good. Thank you. Please collect your certificate. The next presenter is Dr. Mudit. He'll be presenting on a new technique for regmatogenous RD, and the discussion will be Dr. Jignesh. All right, so first of all, good afternoon, and thanks to ARC for giving us a chance to present our work on using fibrin glue in retinal detachments. Now, we all know that whenever we do a pass on a vitrectomy, and vitrectomy for detachment is now becoming more and more common. In fact, in one of the practice and trend surveys, we found more than 70% of surgeons prefer a vitrectomy in cases of inferior RDs also with a single tear. Now the problem is that whenever we you do a vitrectomy, we end up using silicon oil or gas tamponade in all of these cases and they come with their own set of problems. You need to give a post-operative positioning to all of your patient for at least two weeks. There is always a risk of glaucoma, corneal changes and cataract. There is a delayed visual recovery till the time you do a second surgery to either remove oil or till the time your gas bubble gets absorbed. You need to do a repeat surgery to remove the oil. And if you have put gas inside that, then there's a restriction in air travel. And therefore, we decided to see if we can obviate the problems that silicon oil or gas produces by using fibrin glue as a tamponade. Now, what does a tamponade mean? Tamponade essentially are agents which provide surface tension across brakes in order to prevent fluid from flowing back into the retina till the effect of the laser becomes permanent. And it takes 48 to 72 hours for the laser effect to come. So you essentially need a tamponade agent only for 48 to 72 hours over here. And fibrin glue, the agent that we thought of using, has already been used extensively in ophthalmology in ocular surface procedures, in scleral fixation of intraocular lenses, but also in retina, in optic disc pit associated detachments, and even in macular holes. Fortunately, we also have animal studies which show that it is not toxic to the RP. So we have an agent which has been used in retina and is not toxic to the retina at all and therefore we decided to explore its role in detachments. 
so the technique is pretty simple in the terms of whatever you are doing earlier do a vitrectomy settle the retina do a laser but now after doing a laser instead of putting oil or gas you put a drop of fibrin glue to cover the break no post operative positioning needs to be given to any of our patients so this is one of our patients and here if you can see over here we did a surgery for this patient the initial steps are simple you do a complete vitrectomy remove all of the vitreous subsequently after removing the vitreous you do a fluid air exchange through your retinotomy after you have done a fluid air exchange you do a laser but after doing a laser that's when the next step comes now in an air filled globe over here after completing of laser you put one drop of fibrin over the break and after waiting for 2 minutes a coagulum gets formed now this coagulum can be just easily lifted and after you lift it you can just place it to cover the break and that's the end of the surgery you don't need to put oil you don't need to put gas and this is how the patient is the next post operative day with the retina attached visual acuity improving to 20 100 at one week the entire fibrin glue goes away it gets absorbed spontaneously and you have an attached retina and the patient did not have to sleep in a prone position you don't have to put oil you don't have to put gas this is one more of a patient with an rd this is how the patient is on the first post operative day with absolutely clear media and fluid inside the and an attached retina and the coagulum goes away in 2 weeks so we have now done it in more than 50 cases and our outcome measures were at anatomical attachment and improvement in visual acuity and at just one week see the entire visual acuity improves to 2080 this is something which we could never ever achieve with conventional tamponars so these are some of our cases inferior detachment this is how the patient is at one week over here another patient with vasculitis and detachment and this is how again the patient is now at two weeks another patient with an inferior rd 2200 vision first post op day at one week and at two weeks we have now even started exploring it in some of our trd case so this was a patient of sle with a break over here inferiorly and this is how the patient on the first post operative day under fluid eye attached retina coagulum covering the break one week the coagulum gets absorbed leaving behind an attached retina so fibrin glue now allows us basically an opportunity of an absolute early post operative recovery in an rd patient visual acuity improving with one week no positioning no gas or oil tamponade thank you so much fantastic it's uh, going to be a game changer because you are going to stop using silicon oil and all the complications which are coming up will be stopped so it's very nice only what is the follow up period for such cases that you have and what is the vision is it stable or is going down or is coming better so we now we started doing this surgery for the first time in 2019 20 we now have patients who have a follow up of more than 2 and a half to 3 years also and their visual acuity is stable and maintained so the visual acuity that comes at one month finally gets maintained and stays that way and what is the site where you have put the fibrin glue what is the status there does it go into fibrosis or nothing uh, is there any pucker which is appearing because of the glue because of the contraction so anything that no you have noticed so there is no pucker at all because this is a protein it gets absorbed spontaneously by itself within a span of 8 to 10 days so there is no pucker that has occurred over there we have been able to do serial ocds yeah. over that area no, no, no. and all that shows is a flat retinotomy with surrounding laser marks but no membrane no pucker In fact, fact, theoretically, it will actually even reduce the chances of PVR because yeah. how does PVR occur? It occurs because of RP which gets proliferated. Come, Now you have covered the break. You are even preventing RP from coming out. So theoretically, you are even reducing the chances of PVR occurrence in these cases. Fantastic innovation! Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes. So the size does matter. Thank you so much for that question. So this is a technique which is used for early simple RDs, RDs with breaks limited to one or two quadrants. For extremely large breaks, which is breaks larger than three disc diameters, we do not recommend it. And the reason is that if you put it in a very large break of more than three diameters, the problem is that the sub glue can go subretinally and it will not then serve the purpose. What about the clock cast? I have covered 360 degrees all the one thing only in the dependent and uh, superior position. Which positions have you got the maximum so results? So we have done it for in. Superior RDs, we have done it for superior RDs. We have now done it in total for 57 cases. Of them, 29 were inferior retinal detachment. It works extremely well in inferior RDs, also in superior temporal nasal. Once we have put a drop of fibrin and the coagulum has formed after three minutes, it doesn't go away anywhere. It stays that way. Fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. We go on to our next. The next speaker is Dr. Sunita, and she'll be talking on the modified technique for treatment of large acute eye drops. And Dr. Swapna Nair will be the discussant. Yeah. Hello, everyone. So I'll be talking on uh, a modified technique of management of acute eye drops. Acute eye drops occurs due to sudden split in desmus membrane at Duas layer, and there are several ways of managing. This doesn't go forward. 
This doesn't go forward. Okay, so. Can someone reset the timer? Reset the timer. So there are several methods of managing high drops, and there are several problems with each one of them. And uh, in view of this, this modified technique of compression sutures was decided upon. I'll be discussing three situations where this modified technique of compression sutures was applied in the setting of keratoconus, pellucid marginal degeneration, and a high drop secondary to trauma. This is the first case of a keratoconus which was non-resolving for three weeks. And uh, the technique involves making a side port. A small air bubble, 100% air, is utilized into the anterior chamber to define the plane at which the posterior membrane is. These sutures are partial thickness and not full thickness uh, compared to the previous technique described. And this, the reason for this is that when there's acute high drops, there's a significant large edema and it is hard to delineate where the desmus membrane is. So one need not go very deep and we can remove the air at the end and we can see the remarkable resolution of edema happening right intraoperatively itself. These sutures can be subsequently relieved. And this is the post-op day one where there's a remarkable improvement on the day one and post-op day three showing remarkable resolution again in this particular case. The technique can also be applied for pellucid marginal degeneration where there's a peripheral edema and this is one such case where the same technique was applied with compression sutures. In pellucid, the break is concentric to the limbus and hence radial sutures are applied. So this is the pre-op and post-op on the same day. So this was the case of post-trauma with a thin cornea and we can see there's a desmus membrane, posterior membrane split 360 degrees all throughout and this is the cause for the large high drops. Same technique applied, the side port is made, air bubble is injected to define the plane of the level of suturing and partial thickness sutures are again taken. And in this particular case, since the breach is circumferential all throughout, sutures have been taken circumferentially all throughout just like we do for a PK because the split was all throughout 360 degrees circumference, followed by which a BCL and a, uh, the contact lens is applied after removing and very trace amount of air bubble is used. There's no C3F8, there is no SF6, so no tampon adding gases are used. Now this is the post-op day one, the patient has a remarkable recovery and post-op one week when the patient's vision acuity was restored. So compared to the conventional things, what are the modified steps? We take partial thickness sutures. This makes suturing way easier in grossly edematous high drops. Sutures act as draining the fluid like venting incisions and resolution of edema is pretty much rapid. 100% air bubble is used instead of C3F8 and SF6, so they, it eliminates the risk of pupillary block and C3F8 and SF6 gas bubble related complications such as pupillary block and urich zevalia syndrome in cataract formation. This technique is non dependent on gas and air in the anterior chamber and hence it is effective for inferior breaks as well and can be applied to diverse indications that we saw in keratoconus, pellucid, and trauma related. What is the suturing strategy? The guiding principle is based upon perpendicular to the tear when it can be identified. These are the cartoons showing the various techniques in which the suturing pattern is taken. If we can't identify the break, one has to take arc weight and we can use various patterns of incisions, uh, sutures, which could be infinity sutures, figure of eight and mattress sutures. In pellucid, it is more radial. Identifying the posterior tear can be done by using the endoilluminator and the mechanism of quick resolution is based upon the concept which is analogous to external tamponade in buckle surgery for RD. So this brings, the compression sutures brings the biomechanically weak cornea closer to the posterior defect, thereby facilitating the natural process of resolution. So an outcome in 25 eyes with this technique has shown a dramatic clearing. And this is the algorithm which we propose for the acute high drops management based upon the location and the size of the lesion. Thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sunita. Uh, so I had two questions. One uh, is, do you, uh, is there more of scarring uh, because you put sutures, especially we're talking about patients where there is uh, uh, hydration of the visual axis. And second question was, do you remove the sutures at a particular stage or do you let them be? Very good question. The sutures are taken and they are removed once the healing of the posterior membrane is taken. In the visual axis, the sutures are not taken within the stroma. They are taken on the, on the corneal surface, meaning that the internal part of the sutures is in the stroma in the periphery. It is infinity suture and uh, it is overlying the epithelium. It is not within the stroma. And the sutures are removed at 
you know, whenever the healing happens, and usually it is around one month. So we don't see much of scarring with this technique. But the remarkable resolution is pretty much rapid. So the scarring and vascularization which occurs because of long-standing hydrox is taken care of. Thank you. Post Post-op corneal edema is, could be an extension where you can use next day. There is severe po corneal edema. You can always try for this and present it next time. Cause I think it depends on the cause. There has to be. A